Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, and welcome to Comsa Day to those who are joining us for the first time. And welcome to this particular session titled Adaptation Through Nature-Based Solutions. My name is Dr. Kate Strawn, and I am the Comsa Technical Help Desk and Adaptation Coordinator for the Comsa Secretariat, and I'll be your moderator today. The Comsa Initiative is a European Union action that supports the external dimension of the European Green Deal. As the global challenges of climate change and environmental degradation require a global response. At the same time, Comsa moves to strengthen the African EU partnership and supports Agenda 2063 of the African Union Commission. Comsa is a regional chapter of the International Alliance of Cities, the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. It is a partnership between city networks, development agencies, and funding institutions supporting cities in meeting the dual challenge of climate change and access to sustainable energy to achieve a low emission, climate resilient, and sustainable energy future. I'd like to thank our funders, the EU, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and as well as ACID for funding this change-making initiative. We'd also like to thank ACID for their support in organizing this session today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. We'd like today's event to be fully participatory and that everyone gets involved. So the format for today's session is a Zoom meeting. So all participants will be able to unmute themselves, turn on their videos and use the chat function. We ask that you please respect the speakers and stay muted during the presentations. However, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pan of the control panel. And you may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You can also upvote your participants' questions by cl clicking the like button to indicate that you also are interested in having that question answered. I'd also encourage you all to please use the chat function and introduce yourself to your fellow participants today. We also want to inform you that this webinar is being recorded and the recording file will be shared on the COMSA website and all those details will also be in the chat function. Today's session is available in English, French, and Portuguese. Please choose the language channel that you prefer. If you want to listen in English, please select the English channel. If you select off, you will hear the floor in the original language in which the speaker is talking. Our agenda for today will include five presentations. We will address any questions at the end of the session, as I mentioned earlier. So please continue to um, draft your questions in the Q&A panel. And as you're all aware, today's topic is adaptation through nature-based solutions. This session aims to share tangible lessons, experiences, technical expertise, and recommendations, which are solution oriented and provide the opportunity for open discussion. In doing so, enabling these valuable insights from an African perspective to be taken to the global stage. We have some great speakers lined up today for you, and I'd like to first introduce Ms. Stefania Romano. Stefania is the Global Coordinator for the Cities of Nature and Regions of Nature Initiatives. Our second speaker is Veronica Ruiz. Veronica is the Nature-Based Solutions Program Officer um, for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Our third speaker is Lillian Asolba. Lillian is currently a project officer for the Marine and Coastal Program of IUCN in West and Central Africa. Our fourth speaker is Bongani Nsini, and Bongani is the manager of environmental planning and sustainability in the Environmental Management Department at the City of Cape Town in South Africa. And our fifth speaker is Fernand, Fernand Yappi. And Fernand is an engineer in economic ethics and sustainable development 
and a member of the Comsa Working Group in the Mayor's Office of Kakadu. I would like to welcome all our speakers and I look forward to hearing each of your presentations today. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Stefania. And Stefania, today I think we have two questions that we would like to pose to you. And the first one is, what has the impact been thus far of cities with nature? And the second question is, what are the next steps for prospective cities to mainstream nature into their planning and design going forward? And the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, very relevant questions, in fact. I have been uh, um, into cities with nature processes and, um, and relevant implementation for the last uh, month, I would say, and I've seen a lot of developments going going forward. Um, no, last but not least, uh, last week uh, we were presenting cities with nature at the IUCN World Conservation Congress, and I could tell you that we have seen tangible results on the outcomes of cities with nature itself. In fact, very many cities were there. Many very partners were there. We were talking with the French Biodiversity um, Agency, with the IUCN itself, with the, um, the regional um, uh, French. Uh, agency uh, with the territorial municipalities and all the other partners around and the very many cities were there Marseille cities was there uh, but also other very uh, cities and we have seen we have seen that cities with nature is that very platform where results can be taking place where uh, the, the nature-based solutions uh, tools and resources can be uh, embedded into policy making of the of the city's administrators themselves and then and then being implemented. So uh, cities with nature comes as an initiative, comes as a platform, but it's really the place where city administrators, some national governments can share, can connect, and can just embark on a journey. And 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 when when you talk to the cities, when you talk to the people, when you talk to the communities, you can see, you can see effectively uh, the, the the results and the outcomes, but it is just the beginning of the journey because because uh, within cities with nature we are just uh, developing more services, more products, more resources for city administrators, and this is just an ongoing process that uh, I would say each and every city would just take on board according to their own pace, to their own capabilities and 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 opportunities. Uh, Kate, are you still there? Oh, right there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I thought Stefania was going to share her screen for a second. <laughs> no problem. Um, our next speaker is um, Veronica. And today, Veronica, it'd be great if you can briefly explain I, I, IUCN's approach to nature based solutions. And in your experience, what are the keys to success in rolling out? the global standard for nature-based solutions. Sure, definitely. And thank you so much, Kate, for the introduction. I have my slide. I don't know if I, can I share my screen or? Yes, please go ahead. Perfect. Is it a bit challenging with only one? Okay. There we are. Perfect. So, and uh, thank you, Stefania, for pointing out the World Conservation Congress. We just uh, all come back from, from it, a bit of uh, overwhelm about all the discussion going on on nature based solutions. But today, I would like to drag you a bit on, on the work that IUCN is doing, so, is doing. And some of you may know already about the global standard for nature based solutions. Uh, so nature-based solutions, it seems like a, a new, very fashionable term, like everybody's using now, but nature-based solutions have been with us for a long, long time. So however, how UCN has been working for decades on it. We have been already working, we have more than 25 years of experience on nature-based solutions. So for IUCN, this journey of nature-based solutions begins with a very clear understanding of what it is and what is not a nature-based solution. 
especially because concepts that are open-ended are very challenging to implement. To implement those concepts towards addressing societal challenges, such as climate change mitigation and adaptation, disaster reduction, economic and social development, human health, food security, water security, and ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. IUCN's definitions specify these seven societal challenges, the one you can see here in the screen. Some of them need still like a scaling up through innovative partnership and joint efforts, through, as I said, through innovative partnerships. But simply put, these are so natural solutions are solutions that require a healthy ecosystem which can produce goods and services for people without harming nature. This is the most important. We are supporting uh, uh, societies, but also at the same time, we are uh, providing biodiversity benefits. Which is very important is the precision and progress on nature-based solutions have to go hand by hand and contribute toward a more resilient and sustainable future. So IUCN is working in clarifying and ensuring the right use of the nature-based solutions concept and to, in a certain way, to avoid the misuse of nature-based solutions. And this will allow its right implementation and appropriation. And it is very important, clarification. Clarification is needed. However, where a clear definition helps, we need to be able also to respond to questions such as, for example, what is a measure of how well we have covered all necessary bases? Or where do we need to improve our nature-based solutions? So this is particularly important given that the majority of nature based solutions implementer will not come from the conservation sector, like for example, myself working at IUCN or for the natural resource sector. And this is what led to the development of the global standard for nature-based solutions. So the nature-based solutions standard was developed through, uh, through two public consultations that were more than 800 people coming from 100 different countries were engaged. And we just work on it first because IUCN would like to offer a clear and practical guidance that will help with implementation, but second, to avoid establishing a rigid threshold system which could instead we, we more a facilitative system. For what? For designing solutions, in this case, nature-based solutions, for the supporting decision maker, for investment and financing, and third, for informing the scaling up or the impact. So the standard axis look like right now is made about eight criteria and 28 indicators. And I would like to really briefly go through them. These are the eight main indicators, so in, uh, criteria, sorry, so criterion number one is the basis of a solution. We really need to well define what is our problem and which is the societal challenge being addressed. Then we move into criterion two, which is about the spatial and the time, like, uh, time scale. We need to consider the risk and opportunities in a wider landscape or seascape. And then we move into the three, four and five, which are the three pillars of sustainable development. Uh, environmental, sustainable, socially equitable, and economically vi uh, viable. However, it's really unrealistic that we expect a triple bottom line with each time. Like it's, it's very unrealistic to live in a win-win situation. So that's why we develop criterion C, which is about the trade-off. We have to put some trade-off. And then we move into criterion seven, which respond to the need for adaptive management which facilitates continuous learning about system-wide processes and adapting the nature of the solutions according to the systemic changes. We are working with ecosystems. Ecosystems are very complex systems. So we really need to be able to adapt our intervention to the changing conditions. And finally, we have criterion number eight, which is the true potential of nature of solutions. It is where we are realizing through the long-term implementation at a scale, embedding nature-based solutions into policy or regulatory framework, as well as linking to national target or international commitment to enable this to happen. So here we have with our robust yet practical framework as a common basis in truly leveraging the potential of nature-based solutions. And IUCN, we are really looking forward to work together in doing so with all of you. So thank you so much, Kate. 
Thanks, Veronica. And it's really great to hear what IUCN is doing and the work that you got and the criteria that you've put together. I think it's essential for our cities. We're now going to jump back to Stefania and Stefania is going to share with us about what the next steps are for prospective cities to, um, and how they can mainstream nature into planning and design. So Stefania, back over to you. Thank you so much, Kate and Veronica, it was great to hear from you. Uh, in fact, we had a very intense week, week last, last, uh, you know, last, last days at the in Marseille. I don't know whether you were there, but it was very hectic. And I can tell you that you worked so closely and so uh, um, happily, I would say, with your with your colleagues. Um, thank you for the question, Kate. And um, indeed, um, I, I will give a short presentation about cities with nature. But to answer your question first, uh, I would like to say that. One of the benefits and the services that Cities with Nature has been developing recently is the tools and, and resources. And, 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 and then going back to your question, I have to say that, that in fact, ingredients that are needed for mainstreaming nature-based solutions in African cities include clear case studies where natural-based solutions have been implemented successfully already, reports that make the economic financial case for nature-based solutions and show that nature-based solutions deliver multiple social, environmental, and economic benefits, technical reports on how local governments can implement nature-based solutions and staying up to date with global learning opportunities, financing opportunities, and events, since we know that nature-based solutions is a fast developing field. Now, cities with nature have cities to access this via, and for free, via the tools and resources hub, facilitating connections with all the cities with nature partners organizations such uh, WWF, IUCN, um, UNEP, who work constantly and actively, as, you, as we have heard from, from Veronica on Metro Bay, on the Metro Bay solutions. Now, I would be happy to be sharing with you my screen and, uh, and shortly um, um, present, present to you, Citizen Metro. Can you see, can you see this, can you see my, my screen? Great. Yes, yes, you can. Citizen Nature. Nature. As I was saying at the very beginning, it's just embarking on a journey that, that's a platform where you know, all the different players, stakeholders, communities, city administrators can really connect, discover, share, get support, and then, and then turn it into taking, taking action. Um, the Cities with Nature is a global platform where collective action can be mainstream in can, ma can be mainstream in nature into our cities and the surrounding regions. As I was saying at the very beginning, it's a partnership initiative, and the founding partners are ICLA, the Nature Conservancy, and the UCN itself. But there are very many other supporting partners like Cities for Forests, like WWF, Tavu Global. Seminar, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, World Urban Parks, Nature for All. And with all of them, we had very significant events last, last week in, in Marseille, for example. Uh, we channel all, all our news and events to our buzz. And um, our platform is growing. In fact, you can see here if the number goes for 183, but we have been grown to 190, which is a, a number which we have been announced at the, at the IUCN Congress last week in, in Marseille. We know the value of nature. We know how important it is to be enjoying and benefiting from nature in cities. And this is why, and this is why cities, cities with nature is there through its benefits, through its services. Um, I will show you how cities can be building a profile and all the other different products that, that, that all the administrators can be enjoying and benefiting uh, accessing cities with nature. This is an example of the, of the profile, the city profile. For example, this is the metropolitan area of Barcelona. This is how it looks when, you, uh, when a city registers. And as I was saying before, you know, we have been developing recently a tools and resources hub, which are like uh, tools on biodiversity, nature-based solutions, ecosystem restoration, and more. And all the national governments 
could just not only up access those very uh, data, but also upload themselves. And everyone can browse, although not all the services are provided if they're not registered. This is how it looks that we send resources, uh, you know, all the different uh, topics that, that are listed there. And uh, um, some examples which concern the nature-based solutions, for example, smart, sustainable and, and, uh, and resilient cities. Now, uh, it, the, the, this is a working paper for the G20 that investigates the potential of nature-based solutions to help building smart, sustainable and resilient cities, and it covers best practices of network solutions implementations in cities around the world and and its guiding principle for for their for their implementation another example is the urban nature atlas which uh, which is a report from naturalization project that gives an overview of the urban nature atlas which covers uh, nature based solution projects Last but not least, nature-based solutions to climate change adaptation in urban areas, which is rele very relevant to the core topic that we are discussing today. And that's a comprehensive book that explores the dynamics, challenges, and, and breakthrough in accelerating the uptake of nature-based solutions in, uh, in cities. Um, we also have a, uh, the, the, when, when, when you access the, the platform, you can also easily get to the nature pathway, which is a, gu a guide for mainstreaming nature in, um, in local government. Uh, and it's just divided into different sectors, like analyze uh, and accelerate, and each of them has a sub, sub categories that you can tap into. Um, um, we also were Sorry, also Stefania. Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Would you mind just moving slightly closer to your mic? Um, one or two people are just struggling to hear you as well as the interpreters. You can't hear me. Yeah, that's better. Now we can hear you a little bit better. better. Thank you. Okay, yes. maybe I shouldn't put the, uh, the, the earphones. Thanks, thanks. Um, another another uh, tool that we are just uh, being developing is the action plan, which is coming soon, back in September, and that's uh, that's very important because it's in the frame of the global biodiversity processes, and that's for local governments to be just uh, uh, reaching their own uh, their own targets in the in the framework of the post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. Uh, one more tool that we are working on is the City Biodiversity Index, which is just uh, for cities to baseline measurement of the current biodiversity um, profile. And as I was saying before, our network is growing. We are just now up to 190 cities from 58 countries. The last ones which have been joining are uh, Nijmegen in the Netherlands and uh, the city of Tain in, um, in India. Uh, this is how it looks, the percentage of uh, the cities we have, which have been joined uh, cities with nature. As you can see, a substantial portion is is in Africa. In fact, we have uh, over 60 African cities within Cities with Nature, and these are some of the examples. And Cities with Nature is really, I would say, that the platform that virtually connects Barcelona to Maputo, for example, and that's where African cities can really get to those connections, exchanges, and and uh, and um, uh, and sharing. Um, in fact, we have been recruiting cities, African cities, through uh, some 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 projects like the Interact Bio in Tanzania and and the UNA project in uh, in Ghana, and we are working with those cities uh, directly, also to have them share sharing more and connecting more with the other cities and accessing, in fact, the services that cities with nature offers. Uh, these are two examples of the, the two recent uh, partners that have joined Cities with Nature, which is the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and eight, um, 80 Cities, which is an organ a not-for-profit not -for -profit organization, which I really love, uh, especially because they work very much on equity and, and social inclusion for, for communities. 
um, we are not, we are not, our, our efforts are not stopping here because we are relentlessly working also on establishing and setting up a sister platform to Cities with Nature, which is Regions with Nature, which is exactly for regional governments. They have, the request has come from regional governments themselves to, uh, to have a dedicated platform that focuses on nature and biodiversity. And, and this platform will be launched um, during the Airing City on the 8th of October with the Yucatan governor championing it. Uh, from from Mexico. Uh, this is our team. It's uh, Tessel Cool. It's myself and it's uh, Peter Bota. And I'm um, very happy to be um, part of your network as well and uh, sharing with you as well. And thanks again for the invitation. Thanks, Stefania, for sharing such an exciting initiative with us and. Um, Hopefully that is a little bit of a teaser to get other cities in Africa to join and to share their experiences and learn from other cities. Um, and also exciting for us to see what innovative nature-based solutions some African cities are implementing on the continent. Um, I'd like to jump back to Veronica. I think I'm gonna pose a second question to Veronica and if she would like to share her screen once again with us. Um, Veronica, it would be great in your experience if you could share some of the key successes to rolling out the global standard for nature-based solutions with us. Definitely. This time I'm not sharing my screen, but I will more talk about you, the experience that we are having so far. So um, first of all, I think the way we, we developed the standard was a real success uh, because it was a very, it was a collaborative approach that we use um, bringing different sectors on board. And this is why we are really trying to push with nature-based solutions is like break the silos and come all together. We all know that the time is now. I mean, this is the time for taking actions. So we, can, we, we, we cannot still keep working on silos. So this is, I have to say, this is the first, like let's say the first successful uh, lessons learned. And the second one is the way we are rolling out right now the standard. We are piloting each. We have already done an, an and Lilian, who is here with us today, she has been one of the uh, pioneers in, in, uh, in rolling out the standard, is like piloting in different, very, very different diverse type of examples. So this is helping us in really identifying which is not a nature resolution or what it is a nature resolution, because there are many stakeholders there outside, many actors that are still confused, no? Uh, so this is also a, a very positive lesson learned that we have gone through very, uh, let's say a very large scale project, like for example, the case of the WACA project, the coastal resilience project, going from all the way down from the coast of Mauritania all the way down to Gabon to very small scale projects from drylands to, uh, to mangrove going through different type of, of ecosystems. So this is, let's say the second lessons learned. And then also what I, what is now, now, what is also the success of, of this standard is like IUCN is putting in place an academy, the IUCN Academy. And the first course for this academy is the um, Nature Resolution Certification course, which is very important because what we are trying to do is not like to keep the standard for ourselves, but what we want is the practitioners using this standard and start using it. And also what is a, a positive is like the facility that we have launched. The facility is a mechanism for enabling policy, enabling finance, and enabling practice and implementation on nature resolutions. And for this, we have already some uh, uh, donors uh, on board with us. And let's say this, and the last, also the last lessons learned and what we have been successful is in the launch of the certification. Uh, I was just last week in, uh, in Marseille where uh, we launched the um, certification scheme of nature resolutions for, for the global standard, which we are not creating a whole certification processes, but rather what we are doing is working with well-known well and very reputed uh, standard um, companies and consultancy that are, we are working on this and trying to plug the nature resolutions standard into the certification uh, processes that are already in place. For example, we, are, we will work with fair trade, we will go the standard, so I think these are the, the major uh, successes of uh, rolling out the, the standard. And I hope we will keep um, this uh, positive 
uh, tendons in rolling out the standard. Thank you so much, Veronica. That's really exciting. And it's exciting to know that the pilot projects have begun. And I'm sure we're all going to be watching with anticipation to see how those progress and hopefully see these standards be upscaled into larger, bigger projects. Um, and I think it's great that Lillian is our next speaker and hopefully she'll provide some more insights into these standards and on the ground um, experiences. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Lillian um, to the floor. Um, Lillian, would you like to turn on camera? Thank you. Um, Lillian, your first question. No problem, thank you. Um, your first question I'm going to pose to you today is, can you briefly explain the main challenges you have thus far experienced in your program? In French, I will present some slides. It will be in English. My presentation, rather, will be in French and the slides will be in English, I believe. Can you see my screen? Oui. Yes, we can. Veronica was talking about the WACA program, West Africa Coastal Areas Management Program. I'm going to present to you a a case of implementation of a nature-based solutions as part of this WACA program for coastal resilience in West Africa. This WACA program was launched in November 2018 and was developed in partnership to develop resilience of coastal areas in West Africa with various elements investments such as investment for coastal resilience in several countries of West Africa. Among these investments, some are really focused on nature-based solutions and are financed by the French Global Environment Facility, FFEM. This small project, for example, the FFEM project, WACA FFEM we call it, is being implemented in three countries of the region, Benin, Senegal, and Togo, under the leadership of the Dakar Ecological Monitoring Center with the, oh, sorry, with the technical uh, support of the CSE. This project is implemented on several sites. I'm presenting here the site of Saint Louis in Senegal where we implemented different types of solutions. In reality, the MPA is situated on this coastal, small coastal piece of land, which you can see on the left side. And it is situated in an area that was degraded, damaged over time, which you can see on the pictures. And we started being restored little by little in order to enable this area to be restored and stabilized, our program has invested in a restoration, coastal restoration, in order to enable this restoration. We've seen different types of actions or interventions for dunes restoration in this area mainly the setting up of fences. These are dune forming fences to re restore the dunes. This is made up of local materials. There is a monitoring, a follow-up for monitoring this dune restoration. We also have a revegetation. We have implemented reforestry and revegetation and a regardening between 2019 and 2020. This took place 
in order to fix the sediments and make sure that the restoration will be long term. Besides these efforts, one zone was reserved for uh, vegetable growing. We have kept this activity for the local populations and thanks to what is being done there, these communities are able to get benefits, direct benefits from these actions. Of course, this is monitored in time to look at the long-term impacts of these interventions. As you can see here on your left-hand side, you can see the dune being restored with what we call the Tifavel, the fences, if you like, which are filling up, or cases which are filling up little by little. We are really seeing a success in, over time. And the local communities are educated to and trained to use organic pesticides to avoid pollution of the area. There is a recovery and a, an awareness of the well-funded solutions of these organic solutions. And in the follow-up of this project, we've seen an increase of biodiversity in the area with new uh, kinds of birds are reproducing and a connectivity between the ecosystems that is taking place. And that's a wonderful success that we are seeing. What we have noticed also is that in these areas, and I will show you the vegetable growing, these areas are no longer flooded like they used to be in the past. Before we did the dune restoration, these places, these areas were regularly flooded and the Populations were losing the harvest. Now this has stopped in this zone. That's why we're seeing uh, harvest. So all of these interventions we have tried to analyze. And uh, we have done this as a global standard for a nature-based solution. Our conclusion is that what has been done there really meets the recommendations uh, regarding the global standard of the NBS, even though some element might still need um, some um, improvements and uh, some are already defined and we are trying to um, define those points that are needed to be improved and to make sure that we can sure that we are clear about what we want to implement at a larger scale. These are a few links that you can follow to have more information on the project. The challenges really for us, and the main challenges really have been to be able to define solutions, local solutions with the local communities, with the help of the technical, partners finding local solutions based on local uh, solu local materials and capacities and all the local stakeholders are doing the monitoring of what is being done. There was a transfer of skills and competence to make sure that this would be um, taken into account by the local community. That was a big challenge, but this challenge was met successfully. Other challenges that we've had is regarding the financial resources. We continue to do the monitoring of this for all the uh, nature-based solutions. We are also working on the development of synergies with other projects to continue monitor these projects and gather relevant information to upscale these solutions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Lillian, for sharing such an incredible story with us and the successes of a project on the ground that is using nature-based solutions is something so amazing to see and incredible to see that some of the dunes are growing back um, and that areas that were once flooded are no longer flooded. And the involvement of the community also is, is, is something quite amazing to see. Um, Lillian, before you disappear, would you like, could I ask you also if you could please share one or two, um, share with us what are some of the uh, key areas to success in developing sustainable projects that are focused on nature-based solutions? If you could just give us one or two lines on, on yeah, what you think some of the focus areas should be in order to successfully implement projects that involve nature-based solutions. Thank you. Now, can, regarding our own experience on this particular site, what stood out clearly is that one of the main uh, keys for success in order to implement this kind of solutions is really the involvement and implication of the local community that has been a key factor for us. It's very important. They have to have a sense of belonging. The local community must get hold of what is being done and that they would understand in which way this is actually meeting their needs and meeting their challenges in that way. Uh, it's important to meet a societal challenge. Communities have to understand what is being done and understand that the solution offered actually meets a given challenge that is relevant to them, directly relevant. Once you do that, then uh, there are high chances for success. The other aspect, which is also connected to this, is to have to come to a compromise, and that is based on criteria number six of the norms, insisting on the need to have a compromise between conservation and the social economic well being. These are two key factors on this particular site uh, that were absolutely essential for us. And to bring a successful project. As you can see, local communities are now settled in a protected area, which is a, an ongoing project and the local communities can continue their economic activity and take advantage of their dune restoration. At the same time, they are contributing and participating to the reforestry, the revegetation, and the building of the fences, et cetera. And that's really an interesting aspect of the project. Thank you so much, Lillian. And I think it's great to see a whole of society approach being um, put into place here and that uh, challenge that um, combating climate change and the use of nature-based solutions is not just a one organization activity or operation that involves many stakeholders in order for it to be a success. Thank you so much once again for sharing with us. We're now going to um, call upon Bongani um, from the city of Cape Town. So Bongani, if you would, wouldn't mind turning on your camera and mic. Thank you so much. Bongani, um, I'm going to pose to you a first question and I'll come to your second question once you've answered this question. But your first question we have for you today is, what have been some of the immediate effects of mainstreaming nature-based solutions into Cape Town's planning and design? Oh, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Bongani Mnisi, city of Cape Town, South Africa. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'm going to touch on the examples that uh, we've, um, you know, achieved through uh, use you know the use of nature-based solutions, um, and I've, yeah, I think I'll go through the presentation, and that would probably present uh, some of the examples that we have achieved in Cape Town. And um, I will be highlighting this, just going through 
um, the nature-based solutions themselves, the background and talking slightly about the green infrastructure program and, um, and also the use of mapping and uh, proclamation of critical biodiversity under the national legislation for perpetual uh, protection of nature. And also just showcasing some of the projects that were implemented as we learn over time. And what I like so much, it's um, what was highlighted earlier in the uh, definition of by IUCN of what nature-based solutions are. And what I particularly uh, have interest in is the fact that it talks about protection, you know, sustainable uh, management of resources and also the restoration of um, natural and modified ecosystems. Um, you know, particular importance is the fact that it um, um, focuses on societal challenges, you know, where, you know, you start looking at providing, you know, human well-being as well as uh, biodiversity benefits. And this is what is great about uh, nature-based solutions. And um, we see these uh, examples in that they increase the overall, you know, resilient of that particular resource you know, using uh, nature-based solutions, you're able to connect to various other landscapes, um, especially in urban centers. And um, also focusing on the use of native vegetation species that, you know, you find in your cities, um, instead of concrete, um, you know, uh, examples that basically doesn't lead to sustainability of any resource that you, you have in a space. And the city, you, you know, use the uh, spatial component, in other words, the mapping in order to protect its green um, infrastructure, um, which underpins uh, sustainability. And what we also do in the city is to develop various toolkits uh, that guides, you know, where trees need to be planted, what kind of species and why those need to be planted in those areas. And also um, various other projects like, you know, the source to sea, um, as well as the livable urban waterways. And one key example here is the proclamation of a uh, nature reserve. The city of Cape Town has 16 nature reserves proclaimed under the national uh, legislation. And what uh, the significance of this is that over 55,000 hectares of um, you know, city land is proclaimed as nature reserves um, with the green, uh, darker green areas, as you can see on the maps, uh, right hand side, which represent the city of Cape Town Nature Reserve. And we also are grateful in Cape Town that we've got uh, a national park as well, which is uh, part of the green uh, infrastructure that underpins uh, the beauty of this city as one of the best cities in the world as proclaimed by IUCN. And we cannot do this on our own um, because City of Cape Town has got various private landowners who also own land. And, you know, it's best to engage these uh, landowners, uh, you know, bring them on board and, you know, encourage them to protect nature. And so far uh, since inception, we've protected over 2000 hectares of land. And some of these are signed uh, into perpetuity. In other words, land can be transferred, but we know for sure that that land is actually going to be kept, um, you know, in perpetual uh, protection. What's also very important to mention here is that the city of Cape Town also use what you call the uh, land bank. Uh, this we use in order to facilitate development in uh, urban centers. In other words, where you find biodiversity within developed areas, you would encourage development there, but also encouraging to buy uh, land, especially, you know, in the urban edge. Um, and the city has done very well with this, you know, buying land and, 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 and encouraging development at the, at the same time. Also using um, nature-based solutions like uh, clearing of um, invasive species in Cape Town, you know, uh, we're investing, you know, so much money, um, you know, to clear particularly catchment uh, management areas for increased water supply, you will recall Cape Town is one of the cities, first cities in the world, which was at the brink of losing, you know, losing its water. And, um, and we are a, a, a water scarce um, country and a city in itself and water, it's a valuable resource. Working with various partners like the Nature Conservancy, we were able to create the Greater Cape Town Water Fund in order to protect uh, the future resources of Cape Town. And, you know, just by clearing 
invasive species themselves. You, you know, um, you know, over 55 uh, billion liters of water were, you know, released into the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, dams of Cape Town, and these continue to improve. Um, and so far, we've cleared over 50, you know, 50,000 hectares, you know, of these uh, catchment management areas. And um, you know, you cannot actually live without, you know, managing, um, you know, any other activities that affect uh, the functioning of your city. And you can see here using uh, bulldozers, you ask a question why, you know, what was the city doing here? Um, imagine a land which is critical in biodiversity. It's about to be uh, developed. And what we did here is to uh, cut away the topsoil material about 300 millimeters from the ground and uh, transporting it and spreading it across a degraded area. And this allows uh, that area to start sprouting. We also, you know, uh, collect seeds from these places before they are developed. You can see these, uh, you know, uh, various heavy vehicle machinery here at the back uh, in preparation for development. And we're also acting in there. Very, very, you know, important here is that um, while you are using nature-based solutions, you are also able to create jobs and creating skills for people who were previously unemployed. You know, we've got, you know, the river ambassadors, you know, through the Kata Asma program that uh, are employed in the city and uh, the livable waterways. Um, these allows us to uh, ensure that instead of, um, you know, creating concrete uh, tunnels and channeling water into the sea, you're creating natural wetlands where you're able to protect yourself from flooding, but also it makes this uh, beautiful uh, area here, you know, more green and, 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 and much more space, you know, um, you know, to leave us. You know, nature is also protected in there as well, you know, bringing in birds and connectivity as well as, as uh, you know, pollination resources. And um, this is just another example in, um, in Sunfle. Uh, if I can just maybe orientate you slightly. So this would be the outlet uh, into the ocean and uh, looking, you know, from this side towards the mountain, you see now you actually imagine you are from the mountain side you know, leading straight to the ocean where it actually, um, you know, you know, goes out into the estuary. But what's significant about this, it's if you don't deal with uh, pollution, for instance, at the source, you actually would not have a beautiful estuary at all. And that's what the city is actually focusing largely on. Um, also, infrastructure being damaged. You know, when you build infrastructure in the space where nature, you know, used to exist, you find these kinds of problems. And um, now you need to bring back nature in order to restore that space using various materials like the geotextile material, which is biodegradable. And once they develop, uh, once the dunes are restored, you see that um, you know, material gone and, um, and the dunes are established and sand is you know, stabilized and the area begins to restore itself. What a better way of um, creating skills creating jobs, but also recognizing the people who work in that space, because some of these people, they only needed that one certificate. And, you know, through that, they're able to secure even um, further job employment. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Thank you so much, Vongani. And um, I learned something new, having been living in Cape Town, I was not aware that the city of Cape Town had 16 nature reserves. I think that's quite incredible but also the fact that the city is doing so much to mainstream nature into their planning and design. And I think there's a lot of lessons for other cities to take from here, um, especially given that we live on a continent that is water scarce. And there are little acts and little things we can do with nature to ensure that we secure that water. Um, Bogani, I have one more question for you. And um, have you worked with any other international cities to share experiences and learnings on your nature-based solutions journey? Um, certainly, Kate. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, we work uh, with, firstly, the city is also part of the Strong Cities Network, uh, where uh, various cities all over the world uh, need to share various examples. Um, we also are part of the Resilient Cities Network, where, you know, in, in our involvement there, we're able to develop the city's resilience strategy. Um, so, you know, something that is also worth mentioning. 
It's our partnership with Athens um, City. And uh, in here, we're both mayors. We've got, uh, you know, a mayor's portfolio where they're sharing various examples, one of which is the one I mentioned, the source to see uh, the river corridor project and uh, also looking at the premium waste into Athens greenery. Um, so these are some of the examples that we share with various cities. And of course, um, you know, the C40 Cities Climate Change uh, Leadership Group, which the city is part of, as well as the Cool Cities Network. So this is how we make ourselves relevant while we continue to learn and share our experiences with other cities. And I must confirm, Kate, there's no city that can live in an island. If you live in an island, you stop learning. And that's why the city always engages and connects itself with other cities in order to continue being that best city. Um, you know, one of, one of the best, you know, in the world, if I can put it that way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bungani, and I think it is incredible that, yeah, that you have those opportunities to share with other cities. And I think it's important that, yeah, that city networks actually play such an important role in these um, opportunities for you to share with other cities and learn from one another. So thank you so much. Absolutely. We're now going thank to so move. We're now going to move over to Fernand from Kakadi, and um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. And um, my question to you is that, my first question today is, what has been your, the experience of Kakadi in mainstreaming nature-based solutions into its policies? And I think the presentation will be in French. Fernand, over to you. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Or... So it is by sharing different experiences here, as I'm an engineer for de sustainable development, point focal at the Convenance of Mayors and for the city of Kokodi. I must say that the community of Kukudi and is a member partner of Cities with Nature. And we have also participated in the Edinburgh process on the elaboration of the global framework on biodiversity for uh, after 2020. And uh, we worked on the Biodiversity Convention. And for many years, uh, the community of Kokodi is a residential community. And we often have urbanization questions uh, uh, about uh, building, high buildings, and uh, questions on uh, and the environment, biodiversity, green spaces, uh, and the new mayor, Yase, who uh, came uh, for a five year mandate in 2018, he made the environment one of his priorities. And for those who live in Abidjan and visit Kokodi, they can see that the green spaces that uh, existed in the past have been rehabilitated and maintained. I, the leisure spaces and gardens as well. And the population in the past had a problem, didn't find the right uh, space. All the green spaces had disappeared. So families couldn't uh, meet and gather anywhere. And all the spaces today have been uh, rehabilitated, rebuilt. And uh, now people can spend family time together, uh, meet with friends. They have the right spaces and all the plants and trees uh, that are part of uh, our ecosystem and uh, of our part of our landscape. So the rehabilitation of these spaces took place. And at, for those who know uh, well the University of Kukudi, we have a virgin forest, a big forest uh, that is, has been used for many years by teachers and used uh, 
uh, for different experiences, this forest, the same forest, is the lung, so to speak, of the of Kokodi, since it absorbs a lot of uh, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So we take part in uh, the maintenance of this uh, forest. I'm, it's a, a, I don't have the exact uh, size of it in mind, but it's uh, quite big, and we. So we take part in the maintenance of the forest. And this forest hosts a lot of houses, is a house to many different ecosystems. And even during the COVID pandemic, there were preparations made from plants found in this forest. And we must also say that to continue and protect this environment, all the green spaces, all of these spaces are important for biodiversity. So the city of Kukudi has set up a brigade to protect all the green spaces and these natural environments. So maybe for those who know Kokodi, it is a city that has different villages and they live along the coast. We have a 30 kilometer coastline and uh, most of, well, what is the common point uh, in these villages in terms of activity is that the people there make what we call atike and it is made from maize um, manioc sorry manioc flour or cassava flour and the the peelings of manioc are poured in the laguna and then the starch is used to help in the making of this flour and it's also sometimes poured into the laguna or where the women are working and it's uh, smelly so the verb that smells emanating from there And the Convenant of Mayors for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is supporting these populations there in the making of this product in order to make sure that the manufacturing does not have a, a negative impact on nature. And there is a help in the use of the starch of these uh, maniac um, or kambava peelings are for, and also for the cleaning of the lagunas and how to make sure that we make a good use of these and that there's a raising in terms of awareness. Uh, we need to focus on the importance of biodiversity of the ecosystems in order to preserve these lagunas because the mangroves have uh, practically disappeared. There were difficulties for the people living there uh, to find fish in the water. And uh, because of everything that was poured out in the Laguna, all of these uh, uh, fish and um, other species disappeared little by little. So, we had to figure out how to clean these spaces and make sure that the fish would come back. It's by planting mangroves that we restored the populations in these mangroves. And then Kokodi's community in March or June participated in the cleaning of these coasts with the young people, with the youth. 
in the villages by raising awareness on the importance of protecting the environment, the importance of being able to use what nature provides. And these young people also became actors in the cleaning of the different lagunas and actors to protect the beaches and how to implement blue activities. So the community understood how important it was to protect the environment and to have activities there that protect the ecosystems and help use nature for the well-being of the different populations as a whole. So this is what I can say in terms of actions or policies that the town hall in Kokodi led and is still leading in favor of action and adaptation of biodiversity for the improvement and restoration of nature to promote biodiversity. This is what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to, to uh, prepare a PowerPoint. Uh, I, I was uh, very busy with a, a lot of different activities here. My apologies. No problem at all. Actually, it's sometimes quite nice not having a PowerPoint and not having every presenter with a PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> Renee, and I think it's really great to hear that green spaces are coming back into your city. I think in the past we were very quick to build and not think of these green, green spaces and how important they are for societal needs. So I think it's incredible to see that coming exactly. back. Fernand, can you also just touch on what are some, uh, can, you, can you indicate or, um, what are some of the partners that you've worked with in Kakadi to ensure that the community is involved in incorporating nature-based solutions into your city? So first of all, concerning the different uh, communities, we put in place a committee. These committees have different socioeconomic actors in it from the villages. You have uh, active women and uh, uh, the Wise Men's Collective. We have the chief of village. We have the Stud different unions and most of the people working in the villages in in the schools as well people working in the schools teachers and we need to mention that the bank the african bank for development is also supporting us the covenant of mayors as well for um, sub-saharan africa and I would like to also say, and to quote, UCLG Africa, and uh, with which Kukuti is a partner. We need to understand that all the actors, socioeconomic actors in the different villages, they all take part. The big worry, what we need to acknowledge is that our communities in the villages know about the importance of nature. They have knowledge, ancestral knowledge that are unimaginable. So this is why we have the Wise Men's Collective and uh, and these people help us to raise awareness among young people on these topics for them. They don't necessarily feel the importance or understand the importance of nature. So this is why we have this Wise People's Collective to raise awareness. It is important and even crucial. We must really have all actors and all the actors are part of the committee. We also have other partners such as the Bank, African Bank of Development, the Covenant of Mayors for Sub-Saharan 
Africa, the town hall also, the mayor, they also support us in the different activities. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's really great that you touched on the importance of indigenous knowledge and what role that plays in our ensuring that nature is mainstreamed into our planning and into our city once again. I think we often forget the importance of indigenous exactly. knowledge and how what part that plays in our in our plans and our strategies. So thank you so much. We now get to open the floor to questions. And as I mentioned previously, um, everyone is able to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras. So I invite you now to raise your hand if you have a question and you can pose it to any of the speakers. Or if you don't want to turn on your camera or raise your hand, please feel free to pop your question into the chat box or into the Q&A box, which isn't actually on our screen, I don't think. Um, but please feel free to use the chat box if you don't want to raise your hand or turn your camera on. I see, it. I see your camera on. Would you like to pose a question? Oui, merci. Yes, thank you. Hello. I'm very happy. I was happy to see all the presentations of the solution based on natures. That is, unless everyone, the population, everyone realizes that they have a role to play in restoring biodiversity. Of course, the advantages are numerous. I want to greet all the speakers as well and thank them. I'd like to have some advice to know how to commit into this process and exchange with cities that have already experienced these solutions. One question was raised and was not actually answered. That's regarding which areas, which sectors rather can welcome nature-based solutions I would like to hear an answer to this question. In, uh, in Togo, the Gulf Lome One uh, is hosting a number of natural sites and could experiment those practices actually. The population is uh, indigenous. This was the original population of the city of Lomé, they have traditional practices which we could value and optimize. And I'd like to hear some advice on this, how to make the most of this, optimize this and this program, this um, process rather. Thank you. That was my uh, question. Thank you so much. And I think there's quite a few uh, questions in there. So I'm going to hopefully um, pick on a couple of the speakers to answer those different questions for you. Um, I think let's begin first with maybe um, Stefania and as you asked around how sharing learnings and that sort of thing, maybe you could just touch on how Cities of Nature provides this platform for such um, sharing of learnings briefly. Definitely. Uh, thank you so much for the very valuable question, in fact. Um, uh, some of the previous speaker was, indeed, it was just highlighting the value of a platform like Cities with Nature for sharing, exchanging, and, and, uh, and having the experiences and practices all together. Um, I, think, I think that, that that's, 
that's a very key point because in fact this is the reason why cities with nature was was established um and that 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 has a very long history behind because it, it started uh during the, the united nations uh, uh processes a long time ago as a request of the cities themselves uh through uh uh, local action uh, program and then uh, since that very project which was run in Africa in fact was very successful it's been the request of cities themselves that that from from their request and then cities with nature was established and then and then and then developed now now the the reason is is that cities cities administrators communities stakeholders researchers find throughout the platform itself the place where they can they can share best practices that that through the webinars that we are running and the events that we had before COVID nineteen they could find that the space where they could just talk to each other because the story goes that that you know there might be different experiences between Paris or Nantes for example in France but the but the 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 good practices that that Paris or Barcelona are being developing are definitely useful for also for the small towns which are in the very region or as I was saying before that's a great value that Barcelona can be connected to uh, to Maputo in Africa because there might be different uh, processes which are going on in detail but then the overall goal is the same the overall mission is the same which is in fact the well-being of citizens and, and communities so so I would say that that in fact is through exchanging is through sharing that there is the, bad, the, the value added and there is the understanding and the improvement of, of processes. I hope it answered the, the question. Thanks, Stefania. And um, I think I'm gonna ask someone from the technical team if they can just pop Cities of Nature um, website address into the chat so that everyone here can see it. And does yeah, that is something that your city would like to look into. Um, and set up a profile and then you're able to follow some of the other cities and see what they are doing. I think another great question that came out of um, from Dossier was that which sectors can adopt nature-based solutions? And I think there's two people who could possibly answer this question really well. And Veronica, I think maybe you can touch on some of the work working with maybe cities and different sectors or departments, as well as Bongani. I think in your role, how you've worked with other departments and sectors and ensuring that nature-based solutions are mainstreamed into their plans and policies and activities. So Veronica, would you like to touch on that question slightly first and then I'll hand over to Bongani. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in terms of, of cities, so nature-based solutions, I, I can talk uh, importantly more at, at an European level, right? Because it's, um, we have really been uh, progressing a lot in 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 this sense so this is the the thing that how we work in this sense and also thinking about uh, how we use the, the global standard for getting involved at different scale for example these are the city or the urban scale is the importance of bringing all the right stakeholders on board we need all the different actors from local actors talking about the city planners but also what about the local actors what are the real the, the ones that really know what are their needs, right? In terms of like what are the uh, facilities that they may need to be integrated into the different planning. So this we have been in terms of I'm sorry, someone writing messages starting. Um, so in terms of uh, how nature-based solutions have been uh, implemented already, so we can talk about at the very local scale, thinking about on a neighbor, but also thinking about like at the regional scale, how nature-based solutions can be implemented in uh, a strategies and more at the longer term. We see already at the European level, but also for example, in case studies outside of, of, of the region that we have been seeing already how they have been included into national policies to make sure, for example, that when even that simple that building a road could be based on nature-based solutions. So these are re really good example of how nature-based solutions have been implemented at the local, national, but even at, re at the regional level. 
Thanks so much, Varang. And I think that's so applicable with so many countries at the moment updating their NDCs and ensuring that we see nature-based solutions incorporated into our nationally determined contributions. And as a result, those localized and local level and incorporated into their implementation plans. Um, Bongani, I think you're in a good position to maybe share how you worked with some different departments within the city of Cape Town in um, ensuring that nature-based solutions are adopted by them also. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I just wanted to share that, uh, you know, nature-based solutions can be used certainly in, 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 you know, I would say in many sectors and, and you, you wouldn't want to limit it. I mean, for instance, in Cape Town, you know, we work even with the roads department. Um, and I think also nature-based solutions, one has to also look at the, at the definition much more broader. I mean, for instance, you know, avoiding dumping material, it's actually a nature-based solution in itself because you, you're actually reducing dump material, you know, reusing material. For instance, if you look at um, asphalt, you know, when you're ripping the road, you know, you're crushing that and reusing that you basically are working with nature. In other words, you don't dump the resources, go and rip another mountain open to get you know, materials and that. So that's how one has to look at it. Um, to always think broader, you may even you know, think of using, say for instance, um, the interlocking bricks or grass blocks, often people use it. So instead of having a canalized um, you know, river that is simply just canals that you know, channels the water straight to the ocean, but you can have such that are actually softer and they're able to allow um, you know, various plant species to grow in that space. So you're actually allowing uh, um, nature to grow while you're still achieving you know, your, your engineering services as well. But I think what I find, Kate, is that um, nature-based solutions tend to take time and they need patience. And often uh, they get to be ignored until it's too late. And when that happens, people think they don't work. But I think what I like about nature-based solutions, and I want to encourage everyone, is that in that process, even though it takes time, once it is established, the benefits are long-term. And not only does it benefit whatever you were trying to, to do, you are able to bring in other you know, connectivity in that space. That's what I'd like to share, Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bongani. I think that's a great point that you touched on. I mean, in many parts of the world, the dominant approach to dealing with climate change and that sort of thing has been engineered interventions. And that actually in the long run and in the long term, nature can provide the best defense against climate change um, and dealing with the impacts of climate change. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think we have time hopefully for one last question. And this question is posed at Lillian and Fernand. If, and hopefully both you can answer them. That, that is, have you seen the community initiate, initiating their own um, activities that involve nature-based solutions that may not have been initially part of your projects in your cities or um, in your IUCN project, Lillian, that they have undertaken on their own, having been involved in other projects that have, for example, the IUCN project uh, in West Africa? Have they initiated their own activities? Um, they've taken learnings from your projects. I hope I posed that question correctly. Lillian, would you like to begin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Yes, indeed, we realize that populations, communities have a lot of ingeniosity, a lot of initiatives when it comes to restoration, when they have to face uh, uh, the aggression of the seas, of the oceans, they can come up with some amazing strategies to try to find solutions to get by. Some are good, some are not so good. And we try to go alongside them, to support them. On one of our sites, for example, you know, a small village, insular village in Senegal, there were communities trying to implement uh, so they were trying to do some works with the local material and they did this totally outside of what we had planned together with them as part of our project the project was planning uh, 
we were planning on building uh, with the help of some tree trunks and there was a feasibility study that was done to look at the various parameters of the region and the possibilities in order to define this project. But before we even got to that point, the community actually developed their own means and needed and wanted immediate solutions. So they committed, for example, in this particular project to find temporary solutions that could be easily uh, taken out later on in order to implement more long-term solutions. So just to show that communities are active and are also looking for solutions. Um, Fernand, would you like to contribute to that question? That's wonderful, thank you. With a few minutes left, I think there's been an overwhelming consensus today and evidence presented that indicates that nature is essential for human existence and plays a crucial role in meeting our societal needs. And I think once again, having seen some examples of on the ground implementation of nature-based solutions, we can see that ultimately nature is our closest ally in the fight against climate change. And there's a need to ensure that at a city level and a local level, that we are incorporating nature-based solutions into our local action plans, our climate adaptation action plans, um, that we're ensuring that other sectors and departments are aware of, of nature-based solutions and how they can include nature-based solutions into their policies and plans at a local level. And I think there's been some wonderful examples presented here today. And hopefully those that have participated today can take back some of these examples to their own cities and to their own activities that they're implementing. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. And on behalf of the Council Secretariat, thank you once again to our funders um, for this um, session and to ACID for organizing what a wonderful session. And lastly, thank you to our speakers. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and sharing with us today. And um, yeah, and thank you to the participants for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Merci à tous et ça a été un plaisir. Thank you. Merci, ciao, ciao. Thank you, bye bye. Merci à tous. Merci à tous, au revoir.